Chapter 48. Living with Keith was, in some ways, not substantially different than dating Keith. We didn't see much more of each other than before I moved in. The main difference was that nobody had to drive home with his socks in his pocket. Certain key aspects of our life together slipped easily into the valley of routine. Keith was Mr. Routine himself. Just for instance, he was used to waking up every day, Monday through Friday, at 6.45, making himself a two strips of bacon and one egg sandwich for breakfast, sometimes Betsy made them, washing down a one a day with orange juice and going to work. Now, he made two sandwiches, sometimes I made them, and he awoke at 6.30, which gave us 15 extra minutes for cuddling, nuzzling, smooching, and often running late. On the other hand, those first several weeks with Keith were like a live-in courtship. He sent flowers to my office with a card that read, Wild thing, I think I love you. Sylvia instinctively dove for them, assuming the dozen red rosebuds were for her. She sucked in her cheeks, lifted one penciled eyebrow, and said, Well, 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 when she read my name on the card. I cooked Keith's favorite knockwurst and sauerkraut from his mother's recipe, wearing only a kiss-the-cook apron. We started our... We started out making banana splits one evening and then ended up doing some very silly things with a couple of bananas and a can of Ready Whip. We wrote each other frightfully bad poetry. We grinned at one another for no good reason, the way young lovers do. Although we lived beneath the same ceilings, we knew one another hardly at all. Every day together was a field trip of discovery, an ongoing study of this strange new flesh we'd found, counting out our similarities and plumbing the depths of our differences. Our differences, if not quite grossly outnumbering our similarities, certainly showed themselves more readily. That was that we were attempting to merge two wildly divergent temperaments and lifestyles was almost as immediately apparent as the fact that Keith was large and fair and I small and dark. I was a pop singer. He was a banker. Period. Keith liked to have dinner at 7 o'clock. Not 6.45, not 7.10, 7. And I was used to having dinner on the run, as often as not tossing a cup of milk, a couple of eggs, some wheat germ, an aging banana, and anything else in the refrigerator that looked interesting into the blender, slurping it down and calling it oat cuisine. The day Keith knocked himself out making barbarian chicken with basil and potato pancakes, and I ran in just long enough to kiss him hello and goodbye, grab some sheet music, and split for a rehearsal I had neglected to inform Keith of, I realized something had to be done. Keith was also used to being in bed, with intent to sleep, by 10 o'clock. I worked past midnight three nights a week and was used to staying up late even when I wasn't working, checking out new clubs, looking over other singers, or just hanging out with Snooky over a cup uh, after cup after cup of coffee at Tippy's, which meant that Keith was often, often fast asleep by the time I crept home, finally ready to call it a night. We both gave a little, as one must in the name of love. I did my best to schedule rehearsals so they conflicted with dinner as seldom as possible, and kept my extracurriculum, extracurricular night owling to a minimum. And Keith never complained or pressured me about my late nights. Well, hardly ever. And when I tiptoed into the bedroom where Keith lay sleeping in, to me, unnatural silence, I'd kiss my slumbering lover goodnight on a hot flesh cheek or nape of neck or exposed shoulder, crawl into bed and feel Keith reach for me in his sleep, pulling me close to his hot, sweat-dampened body, climbing up out of the deep well of sleep just far enough to kiss the back of my neck and whisper, Love you, babe. I realize now, looking back on it all, that Keith putting up with what for him must have seemed my wild, neo-bohemian lifestyle for as long as he did was a major concession for him. Keith was by nature the king of the homebodies. It was, in fact, only by a wild fluke that Keith had been at Sawyer's at all that steamy July Friday night. I first set my mother's slightly slanted eyes on him. <clears throat> he had only gone out at all because Betsy had whined and pouted and stamped her little foot until he relented. God bless that little foot, where, wheresoever it may sleep tonight. Left to his own devices, Keith preferred to stay home on Friday evenings, every evening, if the whole truth be told, but on Fridays especially. I'm a banker, Keith explained to me one Saturday afternoon, as we lolled in bed among mounds of disheveled linens, both of us sticky and pungent after lovemaking. And in banking, Fridays are hell on wheels. It's payday. Everybody in his pet doc dachshund wants to yank money out for the weekend. If you've ever started your work at 8.30 in the morning, spent half the day taking verbal abuse from the sort of lowlife you wouldn't sit next to on a bus, only to find yourself still in the office at 7.30 that evening because your head teller is 2000 some odd dollars out of balance, then you know what I'm talking about. 
By the end of the day on Friday, I am beat. Beat. I could see that. And in principle, it made sense. But the fact of the matter, <clears throat> the facts of the matter were that I worked hard for a living too. And that Keith's career, career day ended at five as mine was just beginning. But that was the difference between us. I love the nightlife. I like to boogie. Keith's idea of a festive Friday night was a cold Budweiser, some dinner, nothing too complicated, maybe a movie on cable, make some love, go to sleep by 10. Which is not to say we never went out. We did. We went to the movies, we shared a passionate love for films, and we indulged it together as often as my schedule permitted. I'll never forget the Sunday afternoon we saw Since You Went Away at the Vagabond in Hollywood. You know that great, you know that great scene where Jennifer Jones runs alongside the train that's taking Robert Walker away to make the world safe for you know what, weeping and waving and calling goodbye? Well, I cried like a baby, just like I do every time I see that sign, that scene. And to my surprise, I heard a wet little sniffle from the seat next to mine and found my former running back from St. Fletcher's in Minnesota, swabbing tears from his cheeks with a monograph, monogrammed hanky. I realized then that I could never truly love a man who didn't cry at movies. We went to concerts, too. Keith and I shared a passionate love for music. So we loved different kinds of music. So what? We learned to share. Keith reintroduced me to Mozart, with whom I had been quite out of touch since I gave up my flute lessons in the ninth grade. Mozart and I had never been the best of, had been on the best of terms. I somehow made it through a recital of old Wolfie's sonatas, sonata, sonatinas, the same way I got through the classical concerts Clara felt maternally obliged to drag me to as a child. I closed my eyes and pictured Brishnikov dancing to the music, clad only in a dance belt. As a child, I had imagined Edward Viella. Villela. Much better was a UCLA opera workshop production of The Magic Flute. I'd seen the opera on a field trip in the fifth grade and remembered a surprising amount of it. During the Queen of the Night's big aria, and quite a coloratura nightmare it is, I turned to Keith, who sat wearing his nicest dark blue suit and look of artistic rapture, and said, It's got a good beat. You can dance to it. I give it a 65. He didn't laugh out loud. We were watching an opera after all. In fact, as, as I recall, he elbowed me rather hard, but I'm sure he wasn't amused. And I did try. I really did try. I smiled through my pain where Keith decided to fill the living room with Mahler, whom I found pompous and morose by turns. I did not run screaming from the house when Keith took a notion to listening to, to listen to and sing along with the ring cycle in its entirety over a series of evenings, even though I cannot but hear the ride of the Valkyries without checking the sky for choppers. I had seen Apocalypse Now three times, and even though I found Wagner in general overly grandiose and just too, too, too tonic. Similarly, when I took it into my head to enjoy the entire David Bowie collection in one afternoon, Keith looked as if his teeth were being drilled without the benefit of anesthesia. We finally struck a bargain that if I would not inflict Bowie upon Keith, he would not inflict Wagner upon me. We worked out together, Keith and I, just about three times per week, alter alternating between his gym, World Gym, home of the future Mr. Olympias, a place I felt much more comfortable staring into than standing in, as the size of most of its inhabitants made even my well-muscled lover seem perfectly Lilliputian and mine, a somewhat trendy Nautilus establishment full of tan streamlined people in matching leotard and leg warmer outfits, where I felt quite at home, though Keith stood out like a linebacker in the corps de ballet. I was used to working out solo, easy enough to do with Nautilus machines. I mean, it's not as if you're gonna drop one of those onto your face. And the buddy system took some getting used to. Still, I quickly grew to enjoy my workouts with Keith. To my mind, Keith was never so beautiful as when he was lifting. Well, almost never. The sight of him between sets waiting for a 50 pound plate or something, his muscles pink and pumped, his threadbare tank top falling down over one shoulder and exposing a big, a big brown nipple made my blood rush straight downward and caused a serious overcrowding problem in my jackstrap. Um, he looked so juicy. It was often all I could do not to take a bite out of him right there on the squat, by the squat rack. <clears throat> Keith was an aggressive workout partner, pushing me well past the point I would push myself, coaxing, cajoling, teasing, that last skin-bursting repetition out of me, oblivious to the impending possibility of my throwing up. Within two or three weeks, I was beginning to outgrow my shirts. We drove out to Lancaster to see Clara. I can see you. 
I can see where you got your looks, Keith said while Clara was out of earshot. Your mother's a knockout. And she was. I was, as always, just slightly amazed that this tiny lady with the fashion model cheekbones, peren perennially girlish figure, and unlined face was indeed my mother. And a pair of Calvin Klein's dizzy pink fuzzy bedroom slippers and a t-shirt with the word foxy and glittery script across the bosom, Clara could easily have passed for a college girl. He's a hunk, Clara said of Keith in a stage whisper I'm sure he could hear. Hands off, I said. This one's mine. While Clara gave me the body count, which was what I called Clara's bringing me up to date on the illnesses, accidents, marriages, births, and especially deaths among her family and circle of friends, you remember your Aunt Roxy in San Diego. No? Well, she's dead. She plied Keith with enough jam jambalaya and collard greens to feed the state of Louisiana in its entirety. <laughs> That all you going to eat, big boy like you? We spent a hazy gray Sunday afternoon at the L.A. Museum of Art, walking until our legs gave out. We picnicked on the sparsely grass lawn, sitting cross-legged on our blanket, while a Mexican family played touch football, much too close for my comfort. In a rare spasm of domesticity, I had packed a lovely lunch and had forgotten to include a single utensil. But we adapted. I spread Golden's brown mustard onto ham on rye with my fingers. Keith slurped my homemade potato salad from those same fingers and never asked for a spoon. We stared stupidly into each, each other's eyes the way young lovers do. In the gift shop, shop. <laughs> Keith brought me a huge glossy coffee table volume on the treasures of Tutankhamen. It's beautiful, I said, and I and it was. <clears throat> but why? Keith thumbed his finger at, fingertip at the book's cover. A close-up of the face of the boy, boy King's mummy case. Because he looks like you, Keith said. And lo and behold, there was a resemblance. That was when Keith started calling me KT for King Tut. You know, 